Hello, uh, my name is Andy Brazier and I'm presenting our paper that uh, I have co-authored with Nick Wise and Harvey Dearden. By way of background, Harvey is an expert on functional safety and you may have seen his papers in The Chemical Engineer. Uh, Nick has worked at SSE's gas storage sites for a number of years, overseeing process safety in coma, amongst other things. And I'm just a human factors consultant. Uh, I, I know Nick professionally and ha Harvey happens to live quite near me and we occasionally meet in a local pub for a chat. And like all good chat show guests, we do have a couple of books to publicise. Harvey's book provides an excellent overview of all aspects of functional safety and is available from Amazon. And I was the lead author of the Trevor Kletz Compendium, um, which I hope you're all aware of and is available from all good booksellers. I'm sure that you know what a safety instrumented function is. It is often our last line of defence when our control of a process is lost. A SIF is made up of sensors that sense the process, some logic that decides if the process is outside of where we want it to be, and a final element that takes action to protect people, the environment and assets by avoiding hazard being realised. We really don't want to rely on a SIF, but if we get to the point where it's needed, we really do want it to work. The reasons for testing SIF may seem obvious, but we often see it a bit too simply. I mean, knowing that a SIF works when we test it is reassuring. It's a bit like a comfort blanket, but it's not really enough. What we want to know is that it will work when we need it. But of course, nothing is ever 100% reliable. What we really want to know is, is the SIF reliability at least as good as the reliability we assumed when we did our original safety study? Now, in the UK, the specific requirement is that we need to confirm that the risks are as low as reasonably practicable, or ALARP, as it's known for short. You will have gathered from the title of this presentation that we don't believe SIF testing is simple. Even the very simplest of SIF includes a sensor, a, a logic solver and a final element. When you bring in the cables that connect them all together, you know, the, the, com the number of components is, is already quite significant. Most components can fail in a number of different ways. Even a cable can fail open or closed circuit and a partial failure may increase its resistance, which could away the, affect the way a SIF operates. Because we're testing for future performance, it is not just an, enough to test the function. Visual checks are particularly critical, but reliant on the competence of the technician. How do you train someone to carry out a visual check and to make a reliable decision about whether everything is good enough? When you look at testing procedures, you do tend to see many similarities. Whilst that can be helpful, it's often the little subtle differences that are most critical. And because they're subtle, they can be quite easy to overlook. SIF testing is very reliant on human performance, and it is hard to foresee a situation where that is not going to be the case. This is because people have abilities that have proven impossible to replicate with technology and automation, but obviously people have their limitations as well. Carrying out an effective test of a SIF requires a high level of vigilance or situational awareness. One thing that people have very limited is the ability to pay attention to multiple things at the same time. Once our attention has been grabbed by something, it's difficult to see beyond it. So for a SIF, you know, if the valve has closed as expected, we may be reassured that, oh great, the whole system must be healthy. You know, noticing evidence of maybe a, a potential blockage in some instrument tubing takes a very close attention to detail and may not come immediately naturally. The fact that a SIF appears to work correctly when we test it may be enough for a function test, but it is not what we require from a proof test. We need to be very clear about our requirements and they are to look for unrevealed and hazardous failures. If a failure would be visible during normal operation, it would be revealed and not revealed. And if it was always resulted in the system moving to a safe status, it would not be hazardous. There's no technical reason why we cannot cover all types of failure in our testing. But from a practical and human factors perspective, this makes the procedure longer and can distract the technicians from looking for the failures that proof testing should be focusing on. It is very much a case of less is more when we are planning proof testing, as long as we are making sure that we're covering the important things in those procedures. 
vowels are very frequently our final element. To agree a high degree of independence, it's common to have a valve that's only used for SIF, so it's an additional valve. The problem with that arrangement is that it will not operate during normal operations, and so we can have an unrevealed failure, such as the valve sticking. When we come to test the valve, we need to be vigilant for that failure. An alternative arrangement is to have a single valve with dual purpose. This may be achieved by having two solenoids on that valve, one for control and uh, the other for the SIF. Because the valve is operated routinely, becoming stuck would be a revealed failure, but does that, that does not necessarily prove the SIF will function. And when we come to test, we need to make sure that it is the SIF solenoid that is operated. Now, often a tidy up function of a SIF is to send a closed signal to the control system. So the fact that the valve has closed in our test does not prove that the SIF solenoid is working unless we inhibit the control one. It's not the case that one of these arrangements is better than the other. It just highlights, you know, the devil is in the detail and understanding the, 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 the pros and cons of each method um, has to be understood when we come with our test method. I have heard it said many times that proof testing has to be end to end. This means that every component making up the SIF is tested from the sensor to the final element in one go. But whilst it seems like a really great target to aim for, it's actually that target is really difficult to achieve. For example, as soon as you introduce any sort of redundancy, you see an end to end test will not have necessarily covered everything. And even if you repeat the same test using each item is rarely sensible or safe to conduct a test under real life plant conditions. So it still cannot be claimed as truly representative of the situation that it may have to respond to. Fixating on end-to-end -end testing is time consuming and distracting, and usually not necessarily. Simpler tests that are focused on hazardous unrevealed failures are generally far more effective. Remember, we don't expect to reduce the risks to zero. We only have to do what is reasonably practicable. SIF testing is fully reliant on people. Usually it's assigned to the instrument technicians, and this makes sense because they have the correct skills and will be familiar with the components. This doesn't mean they automatically understand SIFs and what is important when testing. They can certainly perform a function test without any guidance, but as already discussed, that's not really enough for a proof test. One of the challenges for instrument technicians is that they spend a lot of their time fixing things. They get called by the operations department when something's gone wrong, and they're encouraged to rectify the faults as quickly as possible to avoid any disruption to production. In these circumstances, as long as they act safely, we don't really care too much about how they perform their tasks. This is not really good enough for SIF testing. Yes, we do want the SIF to be working after the pet test, but we also need the data to support our evaluation of how reliable it is. For this, it's vital to collect, collect the data about what the SIF was like before it was tested, the as found condition, what's observed during the testing, and the condition of the system afterwards. Okay, it was working at the time of the test, but is it likely to degrade in the, in the coming weeks, months, years? Uh, another particular challenge is the visual inspection of SIF components. You know, arguably, it's the, the most or one of the most important aspects of proof testing, but it is very subjective. You know, you've got to think about how you're going to train people and assess their ability at that uh, element of the task. And it is also worth noting that finding faults often means extra work for the technician. So this may not always be an incentive to be so particular about the visual inspections that they carry out. SIF testing is a critical task because human errors can mean that the SIF will not work when we need it. This will always be a fairly critical situation. It would be great if we could eliminate human error, but that's simply not possible. But that doesn't mean we can't do anything to reduce the risks. Uh, and we can do that by either reducing the likelihood of the original error or the consequences. Having competent people performing the test is one way of controlling some risks of human error, but it is very important to remember that the most competent people still make mistakes. A good, a good procedure can reduce the likelihood of error or maybe increase the likelihood of recovery from that error by including critical checks along the way, but only if the procedure is technically correct and useful to the person doing the test. Uh, in other words, the procedure has to be used in practice if it's going to be effective at, uh, in this way. Uh, keeping testing as simple as possible will people help people understand what they're doing and why and allows people to use their competence to focus on what is important and vigilant. 
um, and be vigilant to weak signals. I mean, simplicity can only really be addressed through design. So, I mean, do you think about how you're going to test a SIF when you're designing it? Do you consider the potential for human error? And whilst we're on the subject, it's worth noting that actually we often install a SIF in response to a risk initiated by an operator error. We often congratulate ourselves for saying, hey, we've reduced that risk or even eliminated the potential for human error. But all we've really done is transferred that risk to maintenance instead of from, from an operational error. Having identified the vulnerability to your human error, the question remains, what can we do about it? We know that the potential cannot be eliminated, but the risks can be controlled. We have tried and tested methods of identifying and understanding human factors. Task and human error analysis is particularly effective and applicable to SIF testing. We've used it to analyze a selection of proof test methods, taken existing procedures and actively involved in technicians in discussions about practical application. We find that every Proof test is unique. It depends on the nature of the process, the conceptual design of the SIF, and specific component selection. It is tempting to look at the similarities and say that for the same style of SIF using the same technology, we can use the same method. This is correct to a certain extent, but identifying the specific components is a very important part of the test. So we have to be careful to account for even the very minor differences from one test to another. Having said that, an overarching approach does emerge when you look at uh, testing as a whole, and there's definitely in some benefits in defining this. Based on multiple an analyses, we do find there is a, there's a raft of common types of error that can occur. We also start to understand the types of risk controls that will work in practice. Here is a quick overview of the main activities that we've found from developing this overarching method. The first is the preconditions, and these typically involve having approval for any hibits or overhides that might be required, arranging access, having the right test equipment available, etc. So I'll put that to side uh, and look at the, the details. I should say though we have shared the full analysis, the, this overarching human error analysis is available for a, a download and the, the link is there if you wish to access that. OK, so if we have a quick look at the main act actions that make up this overarching method, the first one is something you wouldn't necessarily explicitly state in every procedure. Item identifying the correct components is clearly an obvious requirement, but when you do the human error analysis, you start to realise just how serious it can be to get that wrong. I mean, one possibility is you activate the wrong SIF during the test. Now, that never goes down very well with the operators. You trip out their plant when they're not expecting it. But another is that the compo certain components are overlooked in testing. Now, as a one-off, that may not be too significant, but over time, the implications of only testing part of the system become apparent. I've already mentioned previously the, um, the importance of the visual inspections. And, and again, this is highlighted here in, you know, in some ways it's almost the most important because um, it's not just an indication of how the SIF is performing on the day you test it, but how reliable it's likely to be in the future. Uh, the third action we've identified in this overarching method is preparing to activate the SIF. Depends very much on the circumstances, but the, the main process needs to be in a su suitable condition for the testing, as well as the SIF components themselves have to be prepared. Moving on, action four in this overarching method is the testing itself, and I think it's illustrating that proof testing isn't just about attaching a simulator to a sensor and, and checking the valve closes. Um, you know, the, 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 that's an important part, but it's the what comes before and after that often makes up the, uh, the, the the most important things. We then have, you know, what do you do after the test? Let's assume that it's been successful. We need to reinstate. Um, and this is actually a very critical part. Um, there are quite a number of potential human errors that can mean that a SIF is work that is working OK when we test it is left in a non-operational state. I mean, failing to remove inhi inhibits and overrides is a fairly obvious one. Leaving a, a sensor physically isolated from the process, possibly just by a simple manual valve, has the same effect and is usually far less obvious from the control room or the equipment room. From our analyses, we've concluded that an independent inspection of the SIF components after testing is required. Um, there's someone else to have a look and check everything's been left correctly. There are challenges with achieving independence, and it's not as easy as it sounds, especially with a small workforce. 
in most cases we do have more than one person involved in the testing usually someone out in the field someone in the control room or an equipment room so we feel that at least them swapping over at the end and so uh, so a different pair of eyes comes to have a look at uh, the status of the system when after the testing is, is an effective way of sort of mitigating some of those risks what about if the test has failed well this is largely an operations concern but the instrument department can have a useful input uh, i think it's fair to say that the instinct of operators is to keep plant running um, and might just feel well we'll just be a bit more careful because we know that sifts out of action um, that might be okay for kind of normal trips but for a sifts that have a safety integ integrity level or sill defined that really needs a bit more thinking about the final stage is largely administrative but it's still very important the requirement is to record the data that tells us how well the sif is working its reliability but that data also needs to be looked at now that's probably beyond the scope of the test, but it's a critical part of the overall management system for SIFs. We've identified a number of potential human errors that can occur during testing uh, that can compromise the value of doing the test in the first place. Some are obvious, some less so. The first one's not always a concern, but if the final element is not routinely operated, we need to confirm that it will operate on demand within the necessary time. Now, it's not unheard of for technicians to predict that the valve may stick, so they exercise it a few times so that when they do the test, it passes OK. Now, this is often a learnt behaviour from previous tests where it seemed a bit long to activate, um, but they found if they repeated the test a couple of times, the problem cleared. Clearly, that's not what we need to know. If that's, if that's a problem, we need to know that valve does stick and we need to do something about it. Checking the, the, uh, the status of the final element before the test is something else that's important. I mean, the technician may notice that the final element is already in its trip position and conclude, well, it's OK, we know it's working. But of course, they don't know why it tripped in the first place or whether it was the SIF that activated it. Technicians are sometimes conditioned to think like this because when they're told to carry out the test, they're told by the operators, oh, no, you, we can't open the valve because of uh, operational reasons. Now, some things are you know, might not, you know, far from obvious, things like insulation and trace seating of instrument lines can be actually quite critical um, and very difficult to look into when testing, especially if you're testing in the summer. But a blocked line can prevent a SIF activating when required. And it's actually very difficult to design a test that will, will cover that eventuality in, uh, effectively. Using the wrong test fluid, particularly for a level activated SIF can be significant. I mean, it may, not, may just be that it's not calibrated for the instrument, Possibly worse is if you've used water, for example, and that's not drained effectively afterwards. Is that going to block up? Is that going to form a hydrate or become ice and, and, and block the, um, the, the, the lines to the instrument? Now, we find actually controlling the risks of human error during the main tests is often relatively easy. But human factors tells us that there, there are actions that we don't directly associate with the task, um, but can have an impact and more tricky to control. I'm, all, I'm sure we've all experienced over the last few years, you make a very intelligent and witty comment on a Teams call and wonder why no one responds. You then get the well-known chorus, you're on mute. Not only feel, do you feel like a fool, you've missed the moment to impress the crowd. And errors during reinstatement fall into a similar ca category. It's very easy for the technician to mentally tick off the task, satisfied that everything's working, and in their head, they're already starting to think of the next task to do in their busy schedule. The ability to sense check the SIF is really useful in this case, but works really well if the SIF uses an analog sensor and other analog devices are installed at a similar part of the process. But that's not often not the case. Switch type sensors uh, are a well known example. You know, they're either on or off. The trouble is you have no indication during normal operation whether they're working or not. So yeah, normally we'd say an analog sensor is avoids that problem but only if that sees some fluctuation during normal operation if the process is normally at zero or ambient the even an analog device isn't going to give us that um, that normal um, indication of, uh, of that the system is working the final part of our task in human error analysis involves looking at the performance influencing factors uh, which are the things that affect the likelihood of human error you know, it's not just the test method, it's also the working conditions or the arrangements in place when people are doing the test. Here are some of the examples that, that apply to SIF 
uh, testing. I've already talked about the importance of being able to identify components, so labeling out on the plant is clearly important. The system interfaces determines how well data can be obtained to confirm a successful test, um, but also the opportunity to detect faults at other times. Whether the task is routine or not to the technician can be significant. Doing the task infrequently can lead to errors due to lack of familiarity. Of course, frequency leads to complacency. Time available may not affect the main physical test, but can easily affect the effort put into things like visual inspections and vigilance during reinstatement. Uh, and the last one is particularly important. We have found that quite a few instances where a test procedure requires a visual inspection of something that can act cannot actually be seen due to poor access, lighting or things like lagging being in the way. We have found that task and human error analysis to be an effective tool to better understand the risks associated with SIF testing and how they can be controlled. And whilst we've had a very strong, fairly strong steer from our regulator, the HSC, about doing these analyses for every test, it clearly it's really not sensible to do that. It's, it's very time consuming unless you have a very small number to, to start with. Now, whilst you can't rely on a generic assessment, it has proved to be useful to have an overarching analysis that covers the main issues. The main benefit there is it allows you to identify and focus on the specific differences. Now this can be very important when you're training technicians and to highlight in procedures because it's the subtle differences that are easy to overlook. Um, whilst we've generally found that the main issues can be identified in sort of a workshop analysis, um, there's no shortcut to having a look at every task, every, every example, doing a walkthrough, uh, of finding out what the specific performance influencing factors are for each of the uh, the tests that the technicians are carrying out. And I would just throw in that one useful resource we found uh, whilst doing our analyses uh, came from the HSC um, and it's freely available to download from their website. So my final slide reiterates the title of our paper and don't think that SIF testing is a simple thing to do. It must always be carried out by competent technicians and they have to act use a fully detailed and specific procedure. I mean, I would like it to be different. You know, I'm a less is more person when it comes to procedures. Um, but the only way we can be sure that proof test is done correctly is for our technicians, our competent technicians, to be following uh, good, high quality, specific procedures. This leads me to the words of Trevor Kletz from the 1980s that, um, you know, have we really done enough about inherent safety and passive engineering? And I think it's ironic in the time since, since he was telling us to look at inherent safety, you know, SIFs have actually proliferated, which is you know, essentially the opposite of, um, of, of what was what we were being told to, to consider, really. Um, um, you know, so, you know, I acknowledge that SIFs are going to be here. They are part of our um, risk controls and they will be forevermore. Um, and of all I would then say is just, just, just think about the design stage. You know, if you're thinking about how you're going to test your SIFs when you're designing them and thinking about potential human errors from testing in the design, you are more likely to, to, to end up with a, a system that's safer as a whole. So that's the end of the uh, the presentation. I have just uh, repeated the, um, the the web link to, if you want to download the um, the task and human error analysis we did as part of the uh, uh, to, to support this paper. Thank you.